Hello everyone, and welcome to this new Dota Underlords video. So, it's been two days, and now they've teased the final batch of content that is coming with the big update. Namely, the Underlords themselves. Looks like for now there will be two of them, and we kind of expected those two. Based on what abilities we've seen so far, it's going to be quite amazing and extremely refreshing. It will probably change the game a lot. But let's not just, uh, you know, let's not just throw random words in the air and instead let's dive straight into it and see what they actually do. So, we're in the home stretch now. Today we're covering Underlords and revealing, revealing one of the first Underlords to hit the streets of White Spire. After months of wet watching the beta season from the sidelines, the Underlord are finally ready to join the battle. They will fight alongside their crew and each Underlord brings their own unique set of perks and abilities to support the team. It looks like they will uh, fight alongside their crew first. I I thought that meant that, you know, maybe they will stand on the side of the board and won't actually be attackable or targetable, and that instead they will act somewhat like, you know, uh, heroes or commanders from RPGs slash strategy style games such as uh, Heroes of Might and Magic or King's Bounty, where, you know, your heroes stand on the sidelines and just uh, cast spells and uses attacks, but isn't actually attackable or killable, at least in most cases, and just basically your hero loses when the army is, is gone, and then just sort of sort of runs away. <laughs> but no, here it looks like they will actually stand on the board and also be targetable and killable, which is kind of sort of weird, because the health pool that, you know, every every player has was supposed to represent the health of their underlord. I think there was there was a bunch of stuff written in the game that indicated that. But it looks like they have uh, the developers have slightly changed tax and now they will be, you know, targetable and killable. But I guess those deaths won't be permanent and uh, they will act basically just like any other hero that you normally deploy on the board except they will always be there no matter what you do. The two first Underlords that we are being introduced to are Popgen and Anisix. Well, at least I hope that's how they are pronounced, because based on the spelling, that it's not like Popgen or Anisix or whatever. Let's see what they actually do. So, your Underlord is the primary unit on your board. Each Underlord comes with a set of abilities that use a unique resource called Hype. So. Instead of mana, <laughs> they will have something called Hype, which I guess they are really hyped up for this for these fights, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Every neutral round, starting at round 10, you are presented with a choice of talents to pick from. These talents upgrade the power of your Underlord's abilities. So that's really cool. Basically, the talent system is something that has already existed in Dota 2 before, most of the time. When your hero levels up, they get a, a sort of ability upgrade that increases, you know, the, the the damage the ability does, you know, reduces cooldown and improves it in some ways. But sometimes you can choose those things called talents that don't uh, directly upgrade the abilities the same way that you normally do, but instead add something different to them or add something different to your hero directly, like, for example, increase their health. So here it looks like uh, these Underlords will only have those upgradable talents that will improve their abilities in some new ways or I don't know maybe increase someone's stats maybe the underlords or maybe uh, other heroes the first underlord we're introducing is Hobgen a fairy who also happens to be an arsonist he likes to get in the thick of it with his crew lobbing firebombs at his enemies and lighting his teammates on fire it's a good thing in this case trust us yeah so there's, there's a lot of well, failure uh, there's a lot of favor with a kind of this kind of fire maniacal fairy <laughs> because you know a fairy they have those wings that are usually very delicate and fragile <laughs> and this guy just says frigate Forget about those wings, let's just set everything on fire. I imagine he sets himself on fire all the time too, so his wings should be mostly burned away at this point. As you can see right here, they, they look kind of injured. So the reason this is interesting because he, there are actually very few fairy characters in the Dota lore 
and uh, they have been introduced fairly recently. So, uh, the first fairy character we've seen, besides Puck, who isn't really, well, who is a fairy dragon, but I'm talking about humanoid fairy characters. The first character we've seen was the hero called Dark Willow, which was introduced, I think, in 2017, though I could be mistaken. Uh, Dark Willow was one of the first unique heroes that didn't migrate to Dota 2 from Warcraft 3 Dota or Dota 1. Instead, it was a hero specifically created for Dota 2, you know, the original generation, I think. And now we're, uh, the second uh, fairy character we were introduced to but have never actually seen was Dark Willow's father, who was apparently some sort of a rich dude who is also out for her blood because she burned down uh, the family house and ran away or something like that. And now we see this guy, who is also who also has a knack for burning things down, but is much more serious about it, you know, more passionate, <laughs> it looks like. So, Hobgen, our son aficionado, a ranged-based pyromaniac, Hobgen gets stronger based on the amount of units that's on fire. So, that's interesting. They said, here they said, they said he likes to get to the thick of things, and here they say he's a ranged unit. So, I guess... He does, he does like to get in the thick, but not too thick, you know. <laughs> passive ability. Hopkin generates height passively with an additional amount of for each enemy that is on fire. Any enemy Hopkin attacks is set on fire for a short duration. Okay, so basically the more enemies he attacks, he attacks the faster he can generate this hype and use those abilities to the team's advantage, I guess. So, Explosivo. Hobgen lobs a fireball at a target that deals damage split evenly amongst all targets adjacent and setting them on fire. So, uh, a mechanic like that where the damage of one uh, attack is split evenly among all the targets hit is something that has existed in the in Dota 2 prior. And I wonder if it's going to go uh, to have similar animations to the thing that used this mechanic in Dota 2. Namely, it was an ability called Sunstrike of a hero invoker, famous for his very complicated playstyle. It might be something completely different, but this mechanic where the damage is split evenly was basically to ensure that, you know, you needed, uh, you needed to land this spell very skillfully, and it was also super delayed. Here it doesn't look like it's going to be delayed or anything like that, and you know, while the single target damage might be fairly little, you know, setting even more enemies on fire should ensure that uh, our Underlord will get to do a lot of cool stuff. Supercharge, so Hopkins supercharges the closest friend of the unit, setting them on fire <laughs> again. Uh, I guess this will this fire will also generate hype, even though it's on an ally, and it, it's not clear if this will deal damage or not. I'm assuming it will, because, you know, it, it, it's being on fire, it should really hurt. But we'll see about that. And granting them increased attack speed, so it's kind of similar to Ogre's Bloodlust, <laughs> except it also hurts. There were some abilities in Dota 2 that both, uh, you know, either hurt the wielder or uh, to give them a certain bonus, or, you know, just made them more powerful when the wielder is hurt. That's a mechanic we've kind of seen already, but not really at the same time, because it will just keep happening continually and uh, he will affect allies with it instead instead of enemies or himself. Hopefully the AI targeting works. I'm assuming all those spells are AI cast by the way. I I'm not sh entirely sure about that, but considering it's an auto battler, you know, you should you don't really have control over the actual fights. I'm assuming that all of these spells will be cast automatically without input from the player. So I'm assuming I'm hoping the AI logic is uh, made so that he basically always targets the unit with highest DPS, for example, you know, Luna, or, you know, Two-Star Medusa, or whatever else you have, because, you know, in that way, the attack speed w will actually will actually be use of use. And since the attack speed is basically the only bonus here, besides giving Hobgen himself a bit more hype, it, sh it should really matter, and you should really try to cast it on the unit with highest DPS. So. Pick between two ultimates at round 20. Aha, uh -huh. so this is very interesting. This is kind of similar to talent systems from other games, such as Heroes of the Storm, where, you know, you have access to all of your basic abilities from the start, but ultimate abilities are chosen later, and they are 
also represented as talents. You have to choose between two here, so one of them is called Let's Go Crazy. Popkin gains supercharged. Okay, that is super awkward wording. I think you, you, you should have said something like become supercharged, but whatever. And will continually switch targets to units that are not on fire. Okay, yeah, so basically we'll set everything on fire, gain a large amounts of the hype, and hopefully his cooldowns are low enough where he can actually, you know, actually use all the hype before you know, before it just fills up and gets uh, completely wasted. At least that's what I hope will happen. Also, I hope uh, there is a talent later that will help him, you know, stack multiple instances of being on fire on a single enemy to, you know, amplify the damage. Otherwise, it will be kind of awkward. You know, you set everyone on fire super quickly, and then every other attack or any other spell is kind of wasted because, you know, you no longer <laughs> can no longer set it anyone on fire you can just sort of you know continue the duration which is I guess is useful but yeah it would be really cool if, if you could uh, have multiple instances of fire damage going at the same time I think that would be very useful so friendly fire the other ultimate Hopkins buddies throw bombs on the battlefield so basically from outside the map dealing damage to enemy units so it's very simple you know there's not much to say it's just an AoE damage ability uh, that's pretty much it. I hope it at least sell, sets enemies on fire, but it's not entirely clear, it doesn't say anywhere. It's basically if you're dealing with some, I guess, high sort of summoning lineups or, you know, lineups with a lot of weak units, such as the new Insect Alliance, perhaps this ability could come in handy. You know, none of them are looking like particularly strong or game-changing, I guess. They just, you know, slightly speed up the things that are already happening. But maybe I'm missing something here, and maybe with talent, uh, you'll, may, you'll be able to make something epic happen. It's not quite clear right now. So here we have a bunch of uh, talents showcased. So each Underlord has over 20 talents, but here we're only shown four. So yeah, like I said, that's why I'm saying things like I'm expecting I'm expecting this or that talent from a hero be, uh, from that underlord because you know we only see four here and if these two are included uh, as talents as well like I'm assuming they are then that leaves a total of 14 talents that we aren't seeing here so there is a lot of room for a lot of room for theory crafting and guessing games I am uh, kind of uh, you know almost itching to make some more theories about what talents they could possibly have but i think i would just sit there for hours then so <laughs> not gonna do that you know <laughs> i have the decency to spare you from that so uh grease fire upgrades in particular the spell explosivo so hopkin gains one hype per unit hit in the blast okay so basically not only you get hype from you know setting things on fire with explosivo itself but you also just get some from you know them just being hit so that just basically, again, builds up more hype in order to cast more explosivos and supercharges. I guess, uh, yeah, it's just basically faster resource gain. Nothing too special, but could definitely come in handy. I'm guessing this is gonna be like an early game talent. I'm assuming, you know, uh, some talents will be will only become available later in the game and be stronger than others. And the weaker ones will be available from round 10, round 15, you know, whatever. So this one seems kind of weak, but it's still useful. So if it's like an early game thing, <coughs> could definitely see myself picking it in some in some situation, especially if uh, the others aren't you know are even less impressive. We'll see about that. Uh, so implosion again upgrades explosivo, so doubles the effect of explosivo on the main target. Ah, oh, okay. So of course when he throws this explosivo, he always tar targets one particular unit and then whether or not other units are hit or not is kind of uh, secondary. So in this case, this rewards you for hitting only one target with Explosivo. So I w I'm wondering if this will, if this is going to cha change the AI targeting behavior to maximize the damage. Because you know, uh, the fewer targets you hit with this, then the more, the more damage the primary target takes. And then when you have this talent, uh, the damage should just be basically be outrageous. I'm guessing it's not going to be like Laguna Blade levels, 
but should still be very much noticeable. This this talent upgrade supercharged and it's called Kaboom. So when a supercharged unit dies, it explodes doing damage to a nearby enemies and setting them on fire. Alright, so basically you just uh, need to have some sort of a sacrificial unit that, uh, you know, should die quickly and he will try, he will maybe try to cast supercharged on the unit that is about to die when you have this talent, and then it will increase the damage output even further because, as we can see right now, this guy is just all about damage. You know, there's no healing, there's no like survivability, it's all just damage. <laughs> so, I'm guessing that's this guy's shtick. That the different Dungeon Lords will focus on different areas of improving, you know, the unit's combat capabilities. But in this case, this guy is just damage, 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 damage. <laughs> so, this is Hot Rod. A passive ability, so a brand new passive ability that you, you won't otherwise have at all. Hopkins' attack speed is increased by 10 per level. So I'm guessing the level here means levels that, you know, you know the same levels that you use to increase the amount of units on your board, as well as, uh, you know, upgrade the odds of rolling better units. Yeah, basically you just... Attack speed, I know, I know. hopefully the Underlords can equip an item as well. In that case, you know, you could put something like, uh, you get this talent, you know, upgrade your attack speed a fair bit, and then put like Maelstrom, Skullbasher, or Daedalus on this guy, and then he'll just uh, hit like crazy. So yeah, overall, I'd say it's not exactly clear which lineups Hopkin favors. He, as you can see, since he's, he has an attack speed buff, uh, you can... Uh, play him in sort of physical damage comps like you know, knights or hunters or even assassins but since he also does a lot of well, what looks to be spell damage I'm assuming most of these abilities will be magical damage so in that case he will also be a good fit for mages so like I guess depending on what what heroes and items the game gives you you can spec this guy differently and then you get either a lot of physical damage output or a lot of magical damage output. So, very flexible in terms of what damage you can deal with him, <laughs> but it's still just damage, 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 all the same. <sighs> now, moving on to the next Underlord, which has been revealed today, an Essex, the Mistress of Secrets. Ooh, spooky. Right in the spirit of Halloween. So, we are back again for one more installment of the big update preview series TM. <laughs> so, this stuff is trademarked now. Watch out, competitors. <laughs> so Valve could send you CND, a CND notice any minute. In case you somehow manage to stick these words into your own updates, you know. <laughs> so be really careful there. Today we will be introducing an Essex, the Mistress of Secrets, the other Underlord who will be joining us as a part of the big update. An Essex summons a demon companion to attack your enemies on her behalf. After all, why do the dirty work yourself when you can just command a psychic to do it for you? That said, she's no mere bystander. An Essex can also heal, uh, cast healing buffs for her crew and curses her opponents. So, immediately we see a demonic puppet master on Essex summons demons to fight on her behalf. So, I'm guessing what this means is that she will, ha she will do a lot of summoning stuff. So, although it doesn't say here directly, I hope she will have uh, some sort of effect similar to summoning still, you know, to improve all of the summoned units. Because that will be a very interesting, you know, concept. Because, you know, after summoning stone, you know, some some abilities that remained in the game became completely useless, you know, like uh, the Primordial Bonus, the Eidolons, they basically do nothing. It's not worth to ever to just go an extra mile and complete the Primordial Alliance even to Tier 2. So I'm hoping she will have some sort of a summon buff type effect, where specifically summon units will be become stronger. So, uh, another interesting note here, when I first saw her, I thought she's going to be something like a fawn, like, you know, those creatures with the uh, goat horns and hooves, similar to Jalexia, the card fawn from Artifact, but here, 
It doesn't say anything about it, so I guess she's some kind of a demon succubus type dealio. Except, you know, she dresses a lot more modestly than the other demon succubus type dealio we have in the form of Queen of Pain. So maybe she isn't a demon at all and actually some sort of creature similar to a fawn, but maybe called differently, I don't know. Maybe we'll see it eventually. I hope Val answers that, you know, very important lore question. <laughs> but anyway, like Hobgen, Nessus comes with her own set of unique talents. They can make her companion beefier, buffs buffier, and curses curseier. Yeah, so basically I'm assuming it means she will not only buff up her own companion, but other summon units as, as well when they are present. So, passive ability. Nessus generates height passively, same amount as, uh, sa same thing as Hobgen with an additional amount for each allied demon on the board. So yeah, basically she wants to have a lot of demons, so I guess this means that full demon lineups that are right now are basically the thing of the past will come back into favor again and uh, she will benefit the most from those kinds of lineups. Although this depends on how big this additional amount is, of course. It might be, it might be not significant enough where you, you've you want to just go out of your way and play more demons. Might just not be worth it. So that's the part that's unclear right now, and we can only see it later. So, she summons a companion to fight at her side. Yeah, so, right here we can see, I think this purple guy with the bow is actually the companion. So, fun fact, this guy actually comes from the original Dota as well. Uh, there, this guy is called the Necronomicon Archer. There is, an, uh, there is an item called Necronomicon what, that lets you summon two minions that will fight on your side. So one of them is a warrior who is a bit tankier and a melee fighter and uh, nukes the enemy who killed him. And this guy here is the archer who has an uh, attack and movement speed aura. And I think he can either mana burn, he can either cast mana burn on enemies or purge buffs from, him, from them. It's either one of the, uh, or the other. I'm not entirely sure. <clears throat> so yeah, she... Okay, anyway, back to the ability. Martyr's Boon. An Essex takes damage equal to a percentage of her max health and provides allied units with healing. So again, it's not clear how many units there are or how much the healing is actually related to the percentage of damage she takes. Like, is it a, is it a similar percentage or is it uh, uh, only part of it? Again, it's not clear, so it's a little hard to theorize exactly what's going to happen. But one thing we know for sure is that this has great synergy with the new Healer Alliance. So, better watch out for that. I guess if you're going Healers, might as well pick her. Then it's also not clear when you get to pick Arnold Lord. Do you do it like before the game starts, before you press the search button? Or do you perhaps pick it before uh, before the game starts, like when the search has been completed and, you know, before the first round. Definitely, if you have her, might be might want to be on the lookout for that healer synergy. So, pure pain. An Essex targets a random enemy and deals pure damage continuously for a short duration. So, basically, it's a pure damage nuke. Uh, nothing special, just based on that. I'm guessing the damage won't be too significant, and notice how it can't actually be amplified by, uh, you know, the Mage Alliance, because it's pure damage. Pure damage cannot be amplified or reduced, except by abilities that amplify or reduce all kinds of damage. There are some of those in Dota, but I'm not sure there are any in Underlords just yet. Pick between two ultimates at round 20, so either you get Enthrall, where she marks her a target for her army, forcing them to attack it. If the target dies, an Essex bring them, brings them back as a demon to fight for her. Okay, so basically, it's like kind of like a necromancy sort of ability where <clears throat> you kill one enemy, then you force them to fight on your side, but instead of undead, they become they get an additional demon tag. So it's not exactly clear how this will work with the whole demon synergy. Because, you know, when you have two, de two different demons on the board, this causes the de your demon alliance to bonus to no longer work. But in this case, since this new demon appears in the middle of combat rather than before it, I'm guessing there is a chance 
that, uh, you know, the demon bonus damage will still work in this case. Hmm, well, this is very peculiar indeed. Summon Demonic Golem. So, an Essex calls in an unholy favor and summons a Demonic Golem. So, again, you can clearly see this Golem here. So, again, this reminds me of another ability from Dota 2. Namely, the ultimate ability of Mr. Warlock, actually. Where he just summons this gigantic golem and uh, stuns all of the opposition in the area. And this golem is actually really strong. Obviously, as the game progresses, the golem gets weaker and weaker. And uh, in the late game, any basically good carry can uh, just kill this golem one-on-one -on -one easily. But I'm guessing since here it's summoned at level 20, it will remain a sizable threat all throughout the game. So, that's definitely something to watch out for. So, here's a preview of some of the talents again. There are 20 in total, but here we only see 4. So there's either 16 or 14 if you count the ultimates that you can see here. So let's check them out, shall we? Exploit weakness. An Essex's companion attacks, uh, attacks break their targets for 3 seconds. So again, a lot more ways to apply break to enemies than there, there used to be. Initially, you know, we only had basically Doom, who applies this kind of ability, you know, disables passives. Then we got Viper with his Nether Toxin, and now it seems like they want to introduce a lot more weight. So I, I'm still not sure if this break thing actually disables Alliance bonuses or not. Uh, but I think it definitely disables some of them. Like, for example, if you Doom, say, an Inventor, this inventor won't explode on death, so it definitely disables some of them. I'm just not sure if it disables all of them. But anyway, this is very cool to see that they want a lot of break in the game. Because, you know, it's not very prevalent in Dota. It looks like it's going to be a lot more important in this game than it is in regular Dota. So, hmm. I'm really looking forward to see how that will work out. Uh, pure Pain. Uh, I'm Excuse me, Phantom Pain. Upgrades Pure, pure Pain. So, your army gains plus two armor per level when an enemy unit is afflicted by pure pain. So it's basically, let's say when you are level six, it's already greater than the warrior bonus and it applies to your entire army. Depending on how long pure pain lasts and whether or not you make it last longer, this could basically give you a warrior bonus without actually needing any warriors. So this is really cool. It's basically another blow against warriors because, you know, right now warriors are the most popular alliance in the game, I want to say. And in this case, there is a very interesting way to not need them. Right here. Of course, it's not entirely clear if you will be able to choose between every possible talent at every level, or you'll be just given a select few similar to, to what happens with items. We're going to have to wait and see as well, because it doesn't really say anywhere. But I guess there is still a decent chance to see basically every talent per game and decide on the best one. So, Transfusion here upgrades Pure Pain and Essex and her companion heal for the same amount of damage done by Pure Pain. Okay, so interesting that she heals her companion, who even though he has a ranged attack, clearly has a bow here. Like I said, it's the Necronomicon Archer, basically. I guess you will, maybe it will maybe make it worth make it worth it to have him take some damage, and uh, then he'll be able to heal him with this. And also, since Anesis herself already has a healing ability anyway, yeah, there's a lot of healing that's going to be going on here. So, I guess this might be, you know, this honestly might be busted with the Healer Alliance depending on the values. Uh, like, high healing is the one thing that I really hate in those games, you know? Like, you put in, like, all the work, all the effort to do all that damage, and suddenly you just heal everything back. That can be really stressful, you know? Really unsatisfying, annoying. But we'll, ha we'll have to wait and see. Again, we can't say anything right now about how strong this is going to be, because we don't see any values anywhere. Martyr's Boon here... Uh, can be upgraded by this talent called Instant Regret. Friendly units affected by Martyr's Boon break their killer 
for the rest of the fight. Oh, okay, so, yeah. You try to heal a frontliner, but, you know, maybe you fail and the, the, and this uh, frontliner still dies. Then this results in uh, the killer losing some important bonus, like, you know, maybe a demon bonus, maybe assassin bonus. This could give you a decent advantage that could turn the fight around. So that's really cool. Another source of break on just one from the same source, you know, the Underlord that you have. Hmm. They really love this break mechanic, don't they? <laughs> so yeah, looking at it again, interesting to see our friends from Dota 2 back, you know, the, the this demonic golem as well as the Necronomicon Archer. Really cool. Again, hoping for more summon buffs because maybe then they will be able to introduce other summons to the game as well. And imagine all those summon buffs with, like, Tombstone or something like that. Oh, man. That's gonna be absolutely brutal. <laughs> yeah. So, all of this stuff is super exciting. I really can't wait to, to try it all out, you know? Especially with the freestyle mode where you basically will be able to try anything you want. I am really looking forward to all of this. And I hope you do too, but... Anyway, if there is something I forgot, or if you have your own thoughts, let me know in the comments. You know, I would really appreciate it. So, it looks like that's it for today. But no more updates, though. So, this is basically the last thing they're showcasing before actually releasing the update. Because we're shipping as soon as we get the green light on all platforms. That's right, baby. We can expect this basically, I'm guessing, tomorrow. Because, like some people said, uh, it can take up to one day, so 24 hours, for the longest uh, approval times on platforms. Basically, the platform that uh, takes the longest time to approve their stuff is uh, iOS, you know, Apple. Even so, they can't just hold it off forever. So, hopefully we get this sooner or later. I'm really excited to try this stuff out, share my, you know, results and everything with you guys. And yeah, it looks like we're in for a wild ride. So, thank y'all for watching. That's it for this video. If you're liking what you're seeing, consider, you know, liking, sharing, subscribing, because it would really help out a lot. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, and take care, everybody.